You're very welcome uh, to our first Let's Talk Sheep webinar of 2023. Uh, I'm Damien Costello and I'll be your host for the next hour or so. So with a lot of scanning uh, of marsh lambing yews taking place at the minute, our focus this evening is on uh, the, the nutrition of the yew flock uh, in the run up to lambing. And to discuss this further, uh, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by my colleague, uh, Dr. Frank Campion. Frank is a researcher based in the Animal and Grassland Research Centre in Athen Rye. Um, Frank, you're very welcome. Um, we also welcome um, Shane Moore, and Shane is a participant in the Better Farm program since about 2018, I think, uh, from at League in County Roscommon. Uh, Shane, firstly, thanks very much for joining us. Um, uh, and uh, you're very welcome. Um, how's all in at league? Um, sheep are housed, scanned, I suppose. Yeah, the sheep are all housed, I mean, um, and the oars are scanned as well. Yeah, very good. And we look forward to hearing a bit more from Shane later on, um, covering some of the, the practical implementation of, of uh, some of what's covered in, in Frank's presentation. Uh, so... To, we're, we're going to kick off with Frank. Um, I might get you, Frank, to start to start sharing your screen, um, your presentation. Um, uh, just a reminder to the viewers, as always, uh, we like to keep these uh, sessions as interactive as possible. So, uh, if you have any questions uh, during the course of the presentations, uh, you can type them. Uh, you can click on the Q and A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, type your question in there, and I'll put it to the lads later. Uh, on your behalf. So with that, over to yourself, Frank. I can see your screen there and everything. So um, thanks very much. OK, thanks very much, Damien. Like I said, good evening, everybody. Um, so yeah, I suppose for the, the first half of this, or roughly half of this, I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, I suppose, some of the technical stuff behind nutrition. And then, as Damien mentioned, we're going to bring in Shane, who's one of our Better Farm participants, and talk about, I suppose, some of the practical implement implementations of those things. So I suppose, like I said, we'll go through some of the, the technical stuff first in terms of feeding management and feed intake, your body ignition score, energy and protein requirements, pre-lambing, forage quality, and how it affects how it affects our pre-lambing nutrition and ration quality. You know, and we'll spend roughly the first half on that, and then we'll, we'll go over to Shane and myself and Shane will have a chat through what he did in, in 2022. And how we employed some of those messages that we uh, we have in terms of nutrition and nutrition management pre lambing well, I suppose to start is to set a bit of a scene as to, you know why is late pregnancy nutrition important. You know it's probably of all the year of the whole sheep production cycle, late pregnancy nutrition is probably the area that gets the most attention from farmers. You know and look at that's with good reason I suppose. It's not only the fact that they're in a lot of cases they're housed and they're under our noses and we have to put a bit more thought into it rather than maybe other times of the year, but it has a big implementation on the performance of the flock for the rest of the year. So it's going to affect, if you look at the screen, they're going from one around to five. You know, the first thing it's going to affect is your lamb birth weight, obviously. You know, so you want your lambs to be on target birth weight so that they're they're viable and vigorous. It's going to affect the performance of the yo and the lamb immediately after after lambing. You know, correctly fed yo's have been shown to, you know, perform better after lambing in terms of their mothering ability, you know, compared to maybe very under conditioned yo's. It'll affect the condition score of the yo at lambing, which has a huge impact in it implementation on our early lactation performance so you know we need we need yo's in good condition at lambing time it'll ultimately affect the the colostrum produced by the yo and one of the things most affected by pre lambing nutrition is probably your colostrum production and that's vitally important to getting the a good start to your to your lamb in early life and ensuring it gets it gets up and running and then the last thing it has an effect on is ultimately the the performance of the yo and the lamb after the lambing particularly for those kind of first six to seven weeks when the lamb is heavily reliant on the milk production ability of the yo in order to meet its performance targets so i suppose what do we do or how do we go about getting our feeding right for these next few weeks then so that we can get our all these performance targets on track and make sure yours are lambing down in good condition with plenty of milk well able to look after their lambs and rear their lambs up to weaning. But I suppose the first thing is to I suppose look at some of the basics and we can sometimes overcomplicate nutrition I feel insofar as we're always looking for the maybe the magic cure or exactly this amount of energy or that amount of protein. Sometimes it's, it's as simple as getting the basics right. So feeding management pre-lambing has a huge effect on how our yo's perform and, our, and on our nutrition plan. And there's kind of five key areas you need to look at here. You know, first one is how does yo's need to have sufficient floor space? So they need to be able to have enough room within the pen that they're not too squashed up together. 
The second thing, and this kind of goes hand in hand, the two of these need to be worked done, calculated out together, is yos being offered feed indoors or outdoors, for that matter, mind you, requires sufficient trough space. So the yos need to be able to get in correctly and safely into the trough without without being squashed up too much or causing too much pushing and shoving at feeding time. You know, we need to be careful in our feed management too. too. So, you know, refuse forage to be cleaned out from troughs regularly. This needs to be done at least weekly, but ideally it should be done twice weekly. You know, so by doing this, we're getting rid of the forage that's refused, no matter how good the silage is, there'll always be something that's left behind. And we shouldn't be forcing the yaws to eat this or clean it out. You know, by cleaning out the, the refused silage a couple of times a week, we're taking that away. We're keeping fresh stuff in front of the yaws the whole time. And it's, be it's better for their overall feed intake. Concentrate feed needs to be managed carefully as well. So, you know, feed, concentrate feeds need to be split into two separate feeds, at least eight hours apart once feeding levels go above 500 grams a day. You know, look at, you might with good management be able to go to 600 grams a day on this, but definitely no higher than that. And it's vitally important those feeds are, are at least two, eight hours apart. And I'm going to come on in a couple of slides as to why that's important. And the final thing then is you always need to have access to clean water at all times. So we're probably all very good at making sure there's water in the pen, but do they have clean water and sufficient access to it? You know, so, you know, when you're cleaning out your, your trucks regularly, your feed trucks regularly, you should also be cleaning out your water trucks regularly to ensure there's no vehicle matter in them, no silage, no nuts being left congregating in them that's dirty in the water and preventing the from drinking it. You know, and previous research work would have shown that water intake has a huge effect on dry matter intake. And dry matter intake is already restricted during late pregnancy, so we certainly don't want to be restricting it anymore by having poor quality or not sufficient amount of water in front of the yaws. So look, we'll just expand out on a couple of those points. I suppose the floor space requirements here as described by the department in their saturated instrument 146, you know, so a large body jaw, which is typical of the yaws we would see around the country on slatted flooring requires 1.2 meters squared per yaw. And then a straw bedded pen requires slightly more than 1.4 meters squared per yaw. So it's slightly lower then for your medium, your kind of 70 kilo yo, and slightly lower again then for your small yo. But I suppose when we're talking about, when we're talking about our typical lowland yo, we're pretty traditionally looking at kind of that 90 kilo yo. And we'll see later on in Shane's example, while his average might be around 70 kilos, there's still yo's within that group that are 85 and 90 kilos that also need to be attended for. Winter shorn sheep, so sheer the sheep that are recently shorn, they require about 20% less floor space. So you can knock 20% off all those values for a, show, for a winter shorn sheep, which you know will help for your tight, tight on housing. I suppose care needs to be done to make sure that's done sufficiently before in advance of lambing that they have wool, grow back, wool growth back on them for being turned out with their lambs in March. I suppose then in, feed, in terms of feeding space, which is probably one of the most important ones and maybe often overlooked at times, you know, medium and large body yaws, they need a minimum of five to 600 millimeters of space for concentrate feeding. You know, and look at realistically, we should all be aiming for 600 millimeters of concentrate feeding because, you know, we will have, most people will have those heavier type yaws in the flock. And also you have to accommodate for the fact that the likes of your triplets are going to get quite big coming up near lambing. And the idea behind this is that all yaws in a pen need to be able to eat meal together at the same time. So when you go in to feed your meal and all the yaws come up to the barrier, all the yaws need to be comfortably in eating. If you don't have this, where you have a lot of pushing, shoving, the yaws are too tight going in, invariably that will lead to poor performance amongst the yaws because they're not able to eat enough. But most importantly, and what we see most regularly is in this situation is generally we see a lot more incidents of prolapses within flocks. You know, and as I said, their failure to ensure that you have sufficient feed space, you know, can lead to significant problems pre lambing Obviously, where you're feeding ad-lib forage, this feeding space can be significantly lower, about 200 to 250 millimetres per yaw. But the key thing with that is it's ad lib forage. It's ensuring that there's forage in front of the yaws at all times, not that they're cleaning out the truck and you're waiting until you can see the, the bottom of the truck before you're going back in again. Because then what happens is when you add in the new forage, all the yaws are pushing and rushing up because they're afraid it'll be gone by the time they get in. And look, at it's important that you measure your pens. Don't assume you have enough space. You know, you'll see the requirements there. Sit down and measure your pens and work it out. You know, your, your standard 4.8 meter bay, a length of that would feed about eight yaws at 600 millimetres per yaw. You know, whereas often people would be considering that they might get significantly more into that. So you do need to actually measure out the the spend space and trough space and see what you have available to you. You know, when you're doing that, watch out for the corners. So you see the picture on the, the left there and just pointing to a corner and a pen, a typical type pen that you'll see in most sheep sheds where you have a walk through trough and then you have a feed space along the front barrier as well. But invariably when you look at the yaw on the right there, if she's standing there eating out through the front barrier, she's blocking two to three foot of that space in the walkthrough 
trough. So that needs to be deducted then from the amount of feed space available. And if it's a case that you've walked through trough on either side and you're feeding along the front of the pen, well then that's potentially four to six foot of less feeding space that you have available with those two corners in. So that needs to be considered as well as one of the pitfalls when measuring out pens. Like I said earlier on, I mentioned the, the room and pH and you know why we need to be careful that we put our feeds at least eight hours apart. So could this example is taken from a paper feeding, feeding dairy cows, but it's the same principle for any ruminant. Our blue line is what we typically see in a ruminant animal that's getting forage only. So your sheep that's grazing grass or eating silage only will have a steady enough pH. However, when we add in concentrates, you get what happens in the red line. The pH drops down and takes time to recover up again. Now, what we don't want is the pH sitting below 5.5 for a prolonged period of time. What you get then is acidosis. That's when you see yaws off feed, bloated, scour, and this can ultimately lead to, lead to death. But if you lead your feeds eight hours apart, the pH drops initially when you put in the concentrate, but then gradually rises back up to a safe level. So when you leave your feed eight hours apart, by the time you feed your second feed, the pH has risen to a safe level again, and it's safe for you to feed some concentrates and for that level to drop down again. But that's a very important thing. It can often get overlooked at this time here when we're feeding, you know, building up to maybe high levels coming up near laminate feeding. You know, and it's it's a simple thing. You could be feeding away all week going grand as you're feeding regular times morning and evening and you're eight hours apart and then you come to the weekend and you forget it. You know, it's something that has to be done every day and watched carefully every day. So look, the next thing I suppose in terms of the management before we go into the, the energy and protein is the flock condition score. And this is a particular, I suppose, pet subject of mine for anyone who's heard me talk about nutrition before and so far as I just think it's, you know, it's a vitally important thing. And it's a really easy, excellent way for anybody to measure the nutritional status of their flock. All you need is to do is put your hand on the O and feel along her backbone, as I'm going to explain in a minute, and you can easily assess, you know, whether she's in good condition, bad condition, and then that'll give you an indication of whether your nutrition is, is good or bad or what might need to be done differently with it. You know, and I would always say to people, focus attention on the under-conditioned jaws within the flock. You know, these are the ones most likely to cause you problems, be it before or after lamin. Your over-fat jaws are harder to find. And look at, I know from my own work over the years, I've conditioned score thousands upon thousands of jaws, and it's always the thinner jaws that are more likely to find in the over-fat jaws, and the thinner jaws are more, always more likely to be the ones to have problems. So don't be overly worried about over-fat jaws. It's your thin jaws, and these need to be separated. You know, realistically, anytime the O's are going through the foot bat or vaccinated scanning, you should be putting your hand on the O's and assessing condition. You know, I'm pulling out those kind of thinner O's and managing them slightly differently. And I'm going to talk to Shane later on a bit about what he does with them. There are simple ways about, about dealing with them. And look at, in these kind of last few weeks before lambing, mean, you won't build condition back on yours, but it's certainly important that you keep it on them. And it's much easier to maintain it by the score pre lambing than to try and deal with a, a very thin O post lambing. You know, so how do we assess condition score? What are we looking at? So I would generally say that the target for flocks should be a minimum of three body score three at lambing for house lowland jaws. You know, so we often hear the target, you know, of three and a half at maiden. Yeah, and that's a fair enough at an average. But I think a much better way of looking at it from so at this point, this time of year is looking at your minimum. You don't want any O under three. The only way you're going to do that is stick your hand through the wall. Unless the O was only shown in the last couple of days, you won't be able to look over the pen and properly assess condition. You know, all our yaws in the house now, they're dry, well fed, they look okay. Similar yaws that are outdoors, maybe it's raining on them, it's miserable on them, they might look particularly miserable on an evening like this evening, but the only way to properly assess conditions is put your hand through the wall. You know, what is a condition score of three? Well, there's three areas that you must assess. So the first is the spine. So obviously along the top of the spine, you're looking for different spinous processes. There's different bones along there. The smoother and more rounded that they feel, the more condition she has on her. So, so if you're starting out doing this, often a good way of doing it is put your hand on the very thin yaw, first of all, and you'll get an idea of how sharp the thin yaws can feel. And you'll feel then as you go up the kitchen scores, you start to feel more and more muscle and fat build up, and those processes become more smoother and round. Your eye muscle, which is if you look at the pictures on the right of the screen, you know, there are the red areas, that should feel like a full muscle. So basically, if you have a very thin yaw and you feel that area, you'll actually feel the top of the, the transverse process, which is the horizontal bones coming out from the spine. Whereas the O that is carrying some sort of condition will have, you will start to feel muscle and fat building up. And then finally is the transverse process. And like I said, they're the horizontal bones coming out from the from the spinous process. And you'll see in the picture on the very far right, you feel along the edge of them and they should feel rounded. And you're doing all this between the last rib and the hip bone, that area of the, on the back of the O. You know, and look, at that's a real simple thing to do. And then you can identify the tin ones and pull them out to make sure that they're getting maybe a little bit more attention in the run up to lamb and sort of try and maintain what condition they do have on them. 
and the reason that's so important is because while we don't want we don't want to use condition during the run up to lamin, we can feed yours easier at this stage when they're pre lamin. But after lamin, yours energy and protein requirements will actually shoot up and will go much higher than they are in pregnancy, late pregnancy. When she goes out to grass, no matter what type of feed we offer, she physically won't be able to consume enough feed to meet her energy requirements, particularly in those first couple of weeks after lamin, as her rumen returns to normal after, after lamin, and as she tries to build up her feed intake again. So in order to meet her requirements then and you know be able to produce enough milk for the lambs to grow to the target that we want them, then we need her to be able to mobilize body reserves, burn off fat. And this is the same for every type of yo, and this is just taken from a bit of work I did as part of my PhD with Tommy Boland, and where we looked at you know condition score change in yo's from mid pregnancy to mid lactation across a large number of yo's. And the main message was that all yo's, singles, twins, triplets, they all need to be able to burn some condition at that period in order to meet their requirements and produce enough milk. But she needs to have condition to be able to use it. So we have our feed and management right. We have our yo's in good condition. We've you know made sure that our tin ones are pulled out and we're getting a bit more preferential treatment. You know. Why are we so focused now on these couple of weeks or these eight, six to eight weeks? The reason is, is quite is quite simple, really. If you look at the blue line here, that's your fetal growth. So take your twin bear and yo, your fetal growth is basically your two lambs growing inside of her. That's what that means. From about eight weeks out, that growth increases rapidly. You can see the blue line shooting up. So you're going from eight weeks out having maybe twin lambs inside of the yo with an eligible an weight, very hard to measure, being up to your nine, 10 kilos a liter weight by the time she lambs. It's a huge change on DO. This rapid fetal growth, first of all, means her energy and protein requirements shoot up. But second of all, what it means is because they're growing inside of her, it reduces her feed intake ability as it puts, reduces the capacity for the rumen to expand. So what this does is it makes dietary formulation at this time challenging. And for also then the fact that we have singles, twins, triplets, that has a big effect on the nutritional requirements of the O and the feed intake ability. So for any elements of pregnancy nutrition, you need to consider the expected litter size and litter weight. So without getting too hung up maybe on the, the exact figures in this table, it just explains something what I was saying earlier. You know, your weeks pre lamin down to from eight down to lamin, your energy requirement is increasing significantly while your dry matter intake is decreasing. And that's why we talk about concentrate supplementation pre lamin in order to try and meet that gap that we can increase the energy required by the O or the energy in intake by the O while compensating for a reduction in dry matter intake. So we'll start with energy and then we'll talk about protein. So energy is generally described as the first limiting nutrient of the O during preg late pregnancy. So what that means is the first nutrient is going to be limited or she's going to lack where the, the diet isn't properly formulated is going to be energy. And inadequate energy intake will reduce your performance. She'll burn off body reserves and it'll potentially bring on twin lamb disease. Now, energy requirements increase rapidly in this period. They almost double during the final six to eight weeks. If you take the example then below, so on requirements, so the maintenance requirement for an 80 kilo is about 0.88 of a UFL. And a UFL is basically how we measure the net energy requirement or the net energy value of a feed. And if one UFL is the equivalent of one kilo of standard air dried barley. So she needs about 0.88 of UFL just to maintain herself, never mind the, feed, the fetal growth. So for the fetal growth, for the two lambs then growing inside of this twin bear and yo, you can see in the bottom going from Mike's weeks, six weeks out, right up until lambing, goes from 0.13 up to 0.7. So by the time she lambs, she needs nearly as much energy just to maintain fetal growth for the twin, for the two lambs inside of her, as she does just to maintain herself. So that'll just give you a sense of the huge increase in energy requirement the yo goes through at this time. In terms of protein digestion in, in, or in pregnancy, it's really all about the final three weeks pre lamin and it's all about the quality of the protein. So if you have a good quality silage and a decent ration, your protein will generally be, your crude protein content will be fine. But what you need to be careful of in the last couple of weeks is that the yo's get enough rumen bypass protein. So forage protein, no matter how high it is, will be insufficient to meet these requirements close to lamin. So generally what we recommend is soybean meal is that'll have the best available digestible undegradable protein or rumen bypass protein. And what digestible undegradable protein is, is traditionally when animals consume feed, ruminant animals consume feed, the protein is digested in the, the rumen as microbial protein. And that's used then for VFAs and for digesting fiber. It, what she needs in those last couple of weeks is for the protein to pass into the small intestine 
and be absorbed as amino acids, which helps her develop her mammary glands and have colostrum available for the lambs at lambing. So generally what we'd say is she should be getting roughly 100 grams per scan lamb of soya for a twin, for in the final three weeks pre-lambing. So for your twin bear and she should be roughly getting somewhere around 200 grams of soya, be it through the ration, or if your ration is particularly poor and doesn't have soya, being topped up on top of it for the final couple of weeks pre-lambing. And this has a big effect on, on colostrum produced, and I'm sure the lads will cover this in, in, in things over the next few weeks in terms of webinars and, and different things. But basically, your first colostrum secretions are a reflection of the adequacy of pre lamb nutrition, which can have a massive variation in this. You know, so this was taken from another study that I did where you can see like your average is 539, which is more than enough for two, 10 kilo, for two five kilo twin lambs at, at lambing time. But this can go from a low of 20 up to a high of two liters. But if you have your pregnancy nutrition correct, you should be able to get most of your yolks to produce enough colostrum. So suppose how are we going to meet these requirements? And this is kind of the, the nuts and bolts with the, the practical side of it. Well, look, I suppose, first of all, we need to do is look at our forage quality and test it. And forage quality is ultimately then going to determine how much concentrates we need to feed and when we need to start feeding it. And I suppose that's going to form a big part of what we're going to talk about with Shane. And without getting overly hung up maybe about the feeding levels in this table, we could argue all night whether they're a bit low or whether you change this or change that. The main message here is if you look at your 75% DMD silage, you know, roughly the requirement for that 70 kilo twin bearing yo in good condition is about 20 kilos a meal. Go all the way down the table, as you see, as we go down to our 55%, then our meal requirement is increasing the whole time. Whereas that yo getting the very bad quality forage at 55% needs nearly 70 kilos a meal to meet her requirements. So forage quality is hugely important. And these are some of our silage quality results from the better sheep farms in 22, 23. And look at, we look at all the different quality assessments. And when you do that, you have to, you know, in terms of looking at your dry matter, your pH, your ammonia, et cetera, that'll give you an idea of how well preserved it is, how dry it is, you know, and that'll give you a good indication of overall quality. But I suppose the big one we probably look at most is DMD. And that's what we use then to kind of formulate our diets and base our, our concentrate requirements off of. And look at this year, looking at the group on average, seems to be slightly ahead of last year. We're about 2% ahead of where we were this time last year. But if you look at the minimum, the maximum values, which are kind of the middle values in that screen, goes from 60 up to nearly 80 DMD. So a huge variation there. And I suppose it's very important when we're you know, assessing silage quality or hay quality or whatever forage we're using, is that we actually accurately assess it. So I've taken three different farms within that averages previous averages table and broke out their three different batches of silage. And you can see across the three farms, there's big variation between the three different batches. So if we're only going to, you know, assume our feeding plan off one of these batches and then feed the other batch, we could make a big mistake in terms of how much concentrates we're feeding in terms of feeding too little or too much. So it's important that when we do a silage analysis, we take it from the different batches and the different cuts that we've done. And we also assess how much of each we have. So if you break out farm two here, one silage is 79% DMD, very low level of concentrates required, that's fine. But if we don't have enough of that silage to do our six to eight weeks pre lambing and we're actually end up feeding the 70% DMD silage for the vast majority of that period, well, then it's a completely different feeding plan. While still a good silage of 70% DMD, it's a different feeding plan, more meal feeding going in, going in slightly earlier. So we need to be sure too that when we test it and get a results that we match quantity and quality together. Then onto the rations. So look at, I suppose, I'm not going to go through individual feeding programs, you know, tonight we'll talk a bit about Shane's, you know, the big thing with rations is, you know, quality. And that's looked at by looking at the ingredients of it. So generally ration labels, ingredients will be listed by inclusion rate in descending order. And what we're looking for is plenty of the ones in green, not too many of the ones in yellow and none of the ones in, in red. And with the traffic light system, basically, we're looking at our cereals, so our maize, barley, oats, wheat. We want to see them high up in the list. We want to see our soybean meal high up in the list. And if we do, invariably, most rations will include some of the, the medium and low energy ones. We want to see them low down the list because they will be included in low levels. So I suppose, and ideally in our ration, we'd have two cereals and soybean meal in the top three ingredients. And the top three ingredients, when they're listed in, by inclusion rate and descending order, will generally make up the vast majority of your ration. And look at ration prices have went up a lot in the last couple of years and lads will be rightly looking at what can we do to reduce the amount of ration we're feeding. Unfortunately, everything we've covered so far in terms of the biology of the O and uh, the energy and protein requirements, we can't change that. That's biology. We can't affect that. But we can affect the amount of concentrates we're feeding in terms of our flock management. 
no, and a couple of points here. Look at sell empty yards and your lambs at lambing. Silage even and hay and any sort of forage or root crops are expensive to grow at the minute with fertilizer prices and every other price going up. So any empties should be you know should be shipped out where they went to the ram and not went to the lamb. Good feed and management. Get the basics right. That'll improve your flock performance. That'll ultimately improve your returns in the flock and in your financial returns output. Feed the silage test results. Don't be guessing or shooting in the dark that your silage is too good or too bad. That ultimately ends in disaster. or in So it's, you have to go and test it, see what you have, and then do your feeding plan around it. Pen and feed yours by rattle marks. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. And like ideally, if you have good cognition score, Joe's good quality silage, you should be able to only feed singles maybe for the final couple of weeks. Once again, I'm going to talk more to Shane about that. You know, look at for some people maybe where they have, you know, maybe a couple of extra yo's to what they might want or need. You know, is there an option there that you have a couple of straggler yo's that are dragging on for a few weeks past the rest of them? Maybe for some people there's an option to move them on to maybe when they're lambing a couple of weeks after the rest of them and your attention might be better off out in the fields managing the bit the majority of the crop that's out there. So look at in terms of using the information that's available today and using the rattle marks. If we take some round figures here, just to give a little bit of an example on this, you know, between bearing yo receiving a kilo of concentrates per day for the final two weeks pre lamin, if her concentrates are costing about 500 euro a ton. So we'll assume that she's consuming 14 kilos over those two weeks. That's going to cost us about seven euro for the two weeks of feeding. Which, you know, that is what it is. However, if she's a repeat yo, so if we put the yo's that are lamin week one and the yo's that are lamin week three in the same pen together and we haven't divided them up and they're all being fed from the same time, well, then that repeat yo is going to get an extra 17 days of feeding at a kilo a day. So that's an extra eight euro 50, an additional cost, meaning that yo is then going to eat, an, eat in total 15 euros 50 worth of meal as a versus a potential seven euro. You know, whereas if we have our rattle marks done correctly, we've pulled out our repeats, we start feeding them a couple of weeks later, you know, we have a potential to make a save in there. And that's how we will cut down on ration price. We can, unfortunately can't change the amount she's going to need from a requirement point of view, but we can improve our management and that to help us reduce the overall cost that we're spending on rations on, on our farms. So look, Damien, I've probably talked for long enough there before we maybe bring in Shane. There might be a couple of questions. Yeah, that's great. Uh, thanks thanks for that, Frank. Um, as you said there, I mean, there are substantial savings to be made uh, by, by following uh, some of the key tips you, you gave there in terms of knowing your silage quality uh, and um, also... Uh, you know, feeding to, to, uh, to feeding to lambing date and also feeding to, to uh, scant litter size. Uh, there are a couple of questions here coming in, Frank. Um, just James is asking uh, in relation to your colostrum study in 2017, what what breed of uh, what uh, your breed were you looking at it uh, in that, or was there any specific one? Or? Oh, there was a that stu- that particular graph was showing a mixture of all breeds that were within the study. But when we did break it out by breed, we saw. While there was some individual breed differences, all the breeds that we looked at anyway were still producing sufficient amount of colostrum for the lambs that for, for their lambs. So I think the, the big thing we saw with that was, you know, it's like with any breed study, we probably see it saw more variation within the different breeds in between them. So it's about getting your nutrition right and that'll generally give you enough colostrum. Okay. Um there's a couple of questions, I suppose, uh, one that comes up regularly, Frank. Um um, hay, haylage, or silage, all all being fairly good quality. Which is mm. which is better, or have you have you a comment on that? I suppose for yours pre lambing. Look, at, I'm not going to say which is better. Everyone's system is different. For some people, hay and haylage suit better in terms of maybe their feed management or the, the numbers they have available, and etc. But with any forage, it's about getting it tested, you know, and it have known what DMD you have, what quality of it you have, and then you base your feeding plan off that. Mm. Look at hay and haylage will work fine. I suppose the one thing with hay. And some of the haylages they tend to get pushed out from barriers a bit easier because they're that bit lighter. So you just need to be careful that they're constantly shoved up in front of yours, maybe where a silage sticks in front of the barrier a bit better. But it's like it's any forage, Damien, it's tested yeah. and then you feed to that test result. No no known the quality, and there's no one size fits all, I suppose. Exactly. Um Alfie is asking here, um, with good grass growth over the autumn, um, would uh, if if there's good grass available to yours, uh, would this be adequate for for you for yours pre lambing in terms of nutrition? That's a that that's a broad question. I'd look at in terms of there will be people lambing outdoors who will be you know have grass available, but look at for most people that grass is far more valuable to the yo after lambing, you know yeah. when she's out with her lambs. And what I would generally say is pre lambing it's much easier to feed the yo 
and her lamb, sorry, feed the oh when she's on her own, your silage and your concentrates. And when she goes out to grass, then after lamb and you know, your grass is much more valuable to you then and you should be saving it for that. Yeah, perfect. Um, again, there's there's some specific questions here, I suppose, Frank, on, on um, specific nutrition questions. We, we possibly don't have time to get into them, but just maybe one, uh, to, to pick one, um, your, your opinion on um, feeding molasses. Uh, I assume they're talking about feeding molasses in a, in a, Molasses liquor um, is it beneficial to uh, to yours from a nutrition point of view pre pre lambing? Um, look, I suppose it, if maybe if you're in a hill situation where you're trying to keep them gathered and they will get a piece a bit of energy out, but you know it's it's overall nutritional benefit. I wouldn't know a massive amount of Damien, but look, there is situations where maybe concentrate feeding is impractical or isn't optional. Yeah. You know, your molasses feeder will they'll get something out, but it'll keep them gathered. Um, but you know, in general, if you can get in with some sort of a concentrate, you'll be better off. Yeah, and just one very quick one. Uh, we'll we'll if 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 we have time at the end, we'll get back to 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 more of the, the the questions we haven't got to yet. There's loads of questions coming in, and thanks for that. Um, using uh, the the they give the example here of the advantage feeder, um, where you can have a controlled amount of um of feed going to yours uh, in a in a loose shed. Um, there's no studies I take it on that, or uh, that there's no there's no research on that, or how does it? Does no, it work we've from? no we've no research on that. There, there's no research that I know of being done it, or that, that has been done it that I've seen. Look at I think uh, you just want to be very careful with that. You yeah. know what I mean? I think with yeah. your with your pregnant Joe, she can be quite sensitive to changes in diet. Yeah. You know, and generally we're talking about a stepped meal feeding program, so. Look, it'd be very. I'd be very cautious of it, but like I said, I don't have any. Yeah, the more accurate way would yeah. be as as you described as you described earlier on. I suppose with the the more accurate the more accurate method of feeding. Yeah. Okay, look, at, as I said, if we have time at the end, we'll get back to a few more of, of the, the questions. There's, there's lots of them coming in. Um, I will hand back uh, to yourself, Frank, and uh, you're going to bring Shane in, I think, on, on uh, the, the, the next section. Yeah, so look, at, thanks, Damien. So yeah, I'm going to bring, on Shane, bring Shane in there now. So Shane, if you just knock on your, your camera and your, your microphone. So look, was Shane, for those of you who aren't familiar, is uh, located just outside that league in County Roscommon. He's been in the Better Farm program since around 2018. He has a lowland sheep enterprise flock. He's run alongside a cattle enterprise. There's around 30 hectares of grassland. It's a, it's a fragmented farm, you know, and I think we've discussed that in previous events on Shane's farm. You know, he's the grass 10 uh, dry stock farm of the year finalist. So we had a walk there last year. He was on one of these webinars before, and we've done plenty of articles on that around how he manages the farm. But I suppose what I want to focus on here is what he does with nutrition. So look, at, in terms of the flock, there's 175 mature yos. They're lambing from the 1st of March. There was 35 yearling yos mated. I think, Shane, there was, you had more retained that probably didn't make the mark that are held dry for next year. Yeah, so Frank, there was 20, 25 years there that were ke- or your lambs that were kept dry. Um, they were just let run on. Um, as I'm, as I'm still kind of building numbers, so they're going to be let run dry. Yeah, so look, I suppose the kind of the target number is around two hundred years. So you're going to need you're going to need about fifty your lambs every year to to keep those numbers building. So at your twenty five percent rate, so thirty five of them were picked out for the ram. Um, and then there's the whale and store cattle system on the farm as well. Look, at, in terms of the sheep enterprise, it's kind of a two-way maternal terminal cross. There's been a big focus over the last couple of years on grassland management. You know, Shane's seen huge benefits out of that. And then big work put into developing the infrastructure to allow for flock expansion. And I suppose some of those have given the benefits in terms of better quality silage, you know, easier to manage yours pre lambing you know, and that kind of led on to what we're going to talk about now. And we're going to focus on so what Shane did last year in terms of, you know, we're only starting into this year's winter feeding period. We'll touch off it in a minute, but I suppose last year there was about 156 yards made in October 2021. They were housed from Christmas time onwards on slats and straw. You know, initially we're only getting ad-lib silage and then concentrate feeding began from about six weeks out. Uh, Lamb and indoors on the 1st of March 2022. And then they were turned out to grass as soon as possible after lambing. So look, I suppose if we start off with Shane where we started our previous section where we talked about feed management, Shane, that's your, yourself walking down the, the middle of the, the relatively new shed. I suppose explain to maybe the layout of it. You've slapped some on side, do you, and straw and the rest of it? Yeah, so I suppose that's the new shed. I suppose it's very clean when that picture was taken. It's not just as clean <laughs> today, but anyway. Um, yeah, the slats in the middle, um, double slat pin in the middle, and then the pasture and straw down both sides. Um and I suppose it's divided up in pins. Then the straw bedding is divided up into there's there's what I want to there's eight pins on the straw bedding, and then there's another there's another 
what eight eight pins on the slats as well, so sixteen pins altogether in it, I suppose. Yeah, so you huge scope then for dividing up yours and, and keeping them separate in the rope to laminate. So what what gets the straw and what goes in the slats, or do you have any preference? Yeah, so I suppose the triplet yours, um, after scanning, they go onto the slats or onto the straw straight away. Um and the the yo lambs, the herin lamb, they also go on the straw. And then it's kind of the tinner yos, we'll say the first yos to be fed will be on the straw as well. And the most of the twins then are on the slats and singles. Oh, yeah, very good, very good. So look at, you know, plenty of feeding space, plenty of floor space, all measured out, you know, makes life easier, makes feeding management easier, you know, and it makes, means Shane can keep, keep well on top. But the other thing then with the, the feeding plan that we look, you look at with any flock is your condition scores you've discussed, but also your, your mature weight. So I mentioned this earlier on how, you know, in Shane's case, we have a 70 kilo yo, but a huge range. So you're going from 50 to 95 kilos of yo. So generally when we're looking at the feed and the floor space, we're kind of aiming for that bigger yo, that 90 kilo yo, just to make sure that, you know, everybody has enough feed and floor space. You know, in terms of the condition score, quite good of an average 3.3. Uh, we don't need 13% less than three. And I guess what our target there will be kind of less than, have 10% less than three. But, you know, every year is different. The 13% it wasn't bad, but I suppose, Big variation in the condition scores. And look, Shane, the Tinnerios there, they're probably treated slightly differently. Yeah, so I suppose the Tinnerios, at, at, we'll say when the Rams were turned out, they would be marked as Tinnerios, like, you know. So they would have been the first yos to have been pulled in when, when grass supply started to tighten up in December, like, you know. So they'd be managed kind of separate right through until until Lamon, I suppose, you know. Yeah, I suppose it's probably something as simple as the, the Tinner singles going with the Twins and the Tinner Twins in with the triplets. Yeah, like you don't have to overly complicate it. You don't need to have a, three or four different pins of singles and three or four p- different pins of twins. Like, you know, you can, as you say there, you can just pull the thinner singles in with the doubles. Like, and they're, it's the same thing. Like, they're getting a bit of feeding. Yeah. For. Yeah, that's it. You don't have to overcomplicate. And with your pins set up, you know, you can do that. You know, it makes it very simple. I suppose, look at last year, 13% less than three. I think you're, if you refer back to this year slightly, it's been, a, I suppose, a very wet autumn early winter you probably felt the O's this year might have slipped a bit of condition before they got into the into the shed yeah so I suppose Frank we were, we were discussing this before but I suppose there was 13 percent less than three last year I think this year there was seven percent less than three as turnout but um I just with the wet wet weather I suppose I just felt you know myself handling the O's regular as you say you know it's the only way of knowing what what way the O's are going like you know so the O's did slip there in in November like you know they did that did slip back a bit. Yeah, look, that's probably the country over, and it's a good point. Like, it's one lads have to have monitored at the, this stage. That, you know, you always have slipped in general, and it's important that they're managed and, and it's kept a regular eye on. Look, if you look at your pregnancy scanning results last year, very good pregnancy rate of 95%, litter size of 1.9, reared 1.6, so you had 246 lambs reared off the mature yo, so that's the mature yo performance only. I suppose ultimately in terms of feeding, what's that boil down to? 38 singles, 94 twins, and then triplets and quads, 19. You know, and from a feed and management point of view that we're going to discuss now, that was the, you know, they were the, the figures you were working with in terms of what you're dividing into pens and how you were managing them. So look, at, we tested the silage. We had two particularly good batches of silage that were, you know, there was enough of it to get us from the final, you know, the final two months pre lamin One of them tested at 78.8 DMD, so really good quality stuff. Second one tested at 79.7. So look, at two very good quality silages, but I suppose we we... We assumed then a 78 DMD silage when we were doing the feeding plan. The reason for that being it was the lower DMD of the two, so that we made sure that the O's were getting sufficient feed, even if they were getting the 78 DMD as opposed to the, the 79, 80 DMD silage. So, you know, and like we said, when we were doing up this feeding plan, Shane had a, a budget done. He knew that between those two batches, he had enough to feed everything from eight weeks out up until the end of lambing, so he could stick to the feeding plan. In terms then of the ration, look at very good quality ration, maize, barley, soybean meal being the top three ingredients. So two very good energy ingredients and your soybean meal included. You know, so, you know, we have a very good quality silage. We now have a good ration to go with it. You know, I suppose it's important that the soy is high up in the ingredients list. It's also important that you know the inclusion rate. So we knew with Chain's inclusion rate of soy in this ration that, you know, even at the lower feeding levels, the O's were still getting enough bypass protein or or degradable on degradable pro- digestible on degradable protein. So they were still going to have enough soy for mammary gland development to produce enough colostrum for for a lamb time. You know, and look at as you go down that list, you'll say, yeah, there's things in it there that you would have said were in the, the yellow and the red earlier on, and there is, and that's always going to be the case with a lot of rations. It's just that they're lower down the list and our good stuff is higher up the list, and that's what we're looking for. 
So then in terms of the feeding plan, so look at, we formulated the feeding plan then, the 78 DMD silage, 70 kilo yo, good quality ration. We added a little bit onto each one of these levels just to account for some of them bigger yo's and I suppose kind of a slight insurance policy. And what we ended up with then was the singles got no meal. They only got soya for the final two weeks pre-lamin. The twins got no meal until a month out. They got 300 grams for for the, for the for four weeks out. And then after two weeks out, they got up to 800 grams. The triplets then, look at the triplets were on a relatively similar feeding plan to usual. We might have been slightly feet later starting them, but I suppose with the triplet joes, they're very restricted often in, in their feed intake ability because they have three lambs inside them, or particularly with some couple of chains there that would have been carrying quads. You know, so we left the meal levels relatively high on that. But I suppose look, Jim, that was a, a big change in maybe meal feed levels what you would have done previously. It was, a bit of, was there a bit of a leap of faith with it? Yeah, I suppose, Frank, uh, we had a phone call conversation last year when I was when we were doing up this feed plan and uh, I was kind of hesitant enough, but I kind of I went with it anyway. But um, I was very glad it did. It worked worked very well in fairness, like, you know, it did. And like the singles were lambing down with, with adequate milk, like a lot of, lot of me surplus colostrum was coming off singles like as well you know so it definitely did work very well like you know yeah look at it i think it, you know i suppose it took a bit of management though shane in terms of you you had the good quality silage but you also had to manage that you know manage everything very well in the in the run-up to lamb and you know checking condition and making sure they had silage pushed into them the whole time and you know making sure that you were cleaning out the trucks all that had still had to be adhered to yeah look at it you know it's all you know it's it's the same thing, but you have to keep it. You have to keep it right in front of them. Like you know, there's no point. There's no point letting the O's go out of silage and and go into this feeding plan, and then me ringing you when the O's start lamb and, and not having enough milk. So you know, you have to. You know, it's all right to go with that, but you have to make sure the silage is right in front of them. You know, the whole time, like you know. Yeah, and look at, you know, we said it already. There was a small bit of constant added for each one of these feeding lists for insurance. You know, triples are still relatively high level, but you know they're still carrying three and four lambs. Some of them. The savings with this plan comes with the singles and the twins. You know, that's where the big reductions in the meal feeding level comes from. And that's the reward for making good quality silage. Now, ultimately, if you don't have good quality silage, you can't do this. But I suppose it's kind of the, the carrot for if you can get your silage quality up and get good quality silage made, this is what the low levels of feeding you can get. And that's how you can save on your concentrates rather than, you know, trying to cut back on yours and maybe put them under pressure in the run up to lamin. You know, I suppose one of the key things we look at <clears throat> when we look at performance of the O's in late pregnancies, you know, you know, birth weights. So our target birth weights would have been six kilos for singles, five to five and a half for twins, four, around four kilos for the triplets. And all Shane's birth weights were bang on for, for the target. So we're, you know, they were certainly getting enough feeding in, in the run up to it. As Shane mentioned already, he was happy that they all had enough colostrum. You know, performance of seven weeks was maybe a little back from where it was the previous year, but still, still good. And I think to be fair, Shane, that was probably maybe strong covers of grass last spring that maybe got ahead of you a little bit rather than at Nels. Yeah, it was. It was the strong covers of grass, I suppose, more so than that Nels, Frank, and that kind of was why the up to seven week was slightly back. Yeah, but still, like, it, you know, they certainly had enough colostrum and milk going out of the shed, so the feeding levels were, were adequate. We weren't looking at very thin yos or yos that didn't milk, so, you know, those lower feeding levels are very achievable where you get your silage management and quality right. You know, and look at Shane, I suppose you've, you've made... 78 DMD silage again this year, so you go with a similar feeding plan. Yeah, look at I'm hoping to, I suppose that's one of the benefits of having the good silage, you know, you can you can reduce the meal, like and I suppose again it's the price of it is you know, so anything we can do to reduce the meal, but like that you know, getting this good quality silage, it nearly starts last October, like, you know, with your closing plan and targeting the fields that you want to graze first to, to get closed early to get this high quality silage, like you know. Yeah, I suppose that's the, the thing. You, that's you're you're planning ahead for it, and I suppose your cutting date and stuff is very important too for a gen. Yeah, so like you know, this year the, the first side was cut on the seventh of May. Like, um, now in 2022 it was actually later. It was it was kind of out towards the end of May, but you know, it's the cutting date is is a lot. Like you know, if you get that you know early May to the end of May, you will have you know it's it'll be better than. The June, July size into June, early July size, like it'll be better quality, like you know. Yeah, so look at it. it's about getting it closed up, getting it cut in that kind of six week period and getting your, your grazed out correctly first, getting your nitrogen on it, getting it cut within six weeks. And you know, I suppose you're, it's maybe a slightly lighter cut than you might like to look at sometimes, Shane, but you see the benefits of it then 
<laughs> at this stage of the year. Well, yeah, like, you know, I've said that before, Frank, like, you know, it'd be six bales today, because the most I'd be cutting at any time, like, you know, but uh, it's very little what, what I'm taking out from the sheep, like, you know, there's, there's very little coming out twice a week. Um, yeah. It's it's because it's quality is there, so, like, it's, you know, this price aside just too dear, there's no point in bailing it up to throw it into the dung heap, like, you know. So that's, you know, I just think the six bales is... You know, and the more than six bales the acre, it's just gone that bit strong for the sheep. That's just my own personal opinion, like, you know. But Yeah, look at it. I think the proof is really in the pudding with you. You're getting high DMDs. And look at it, I think, to be fair to you, and it's a comment that a few of the other better farmers have made over the years that when they get the high-quality silage, fine, they're taking lower bales per acre, but there's less of it going in the dung heap in terms of there's very little refusals in it because most of it is leaf and very digestible silage that's, that's going into the bale. So look at it. We're probably coming up to the stage, David, where you want to ask us a few questions, but I suppose just to... To sum up, look at correct free lamin nutrition will improve flock performance at lamin, but also in early lactation. And we know that that's going to affect your overall flock performance for the entire year. You know, you're not going to lower the levels of concentrate feeding by re- rejigging the biology of the O. We can change that, but you can do it with good quality silage and very good management. You know, you're designing f- your feeding plan is designed around the quantity and quality of silage. Now, silage there, but that can be hay or haylage, whatever forage you're using. You design your feeding plan around the quantity and quality of it that you have. You know, and ensure that your ration that you're using is good quality ingredients. You know, and you, you know, that's the main thing is that you have a good quality ration that you're feeding in the run up to lamin. It might cost you that bit extra, but ultimately you're going to get the benefits out of it then in terms of lamin and dairy lactation performance. So, look at Damien, we'll take a few questions if you haven't. Very good. Thanks very much, gentlemen. Um, there, there are plenty of questions there. And um, maybe just to throw one to Shane, I, I've, I've been trying to jot down a few here that are, are similar. There's a, there's a few few questions of, of similar vein. And um, there's a question from Cecil there, Shane. Um, how, how much soy did you feed to singles per day in the in the, in the weeks pre-lambing? Yeah, so I suppose we were saying 100 grams per head per lamb carried like so. Um, that's I was kind of maybe I'm going a small bit, you know, it's very hard to feed 100 grams, so it's probably closer to 150 grams than 100 grams per head per day is what they would have been getting, like, you know. Yeah, and there's a kind of a follow on question to that, Shane, in that, um, the first part of it's it's in two parts. The first part of the question is, how do you deal with your surplus lambs? And the second part is, if cross fostering is part of your plan, and I think you've nearly answered it already, where, where you feed an extra soya to some singles. Uh, you know, or to, to the singles in order to make sure that they had enough colostrum for, for two lambs or enough milk for two lambs. Yeah, so I suppose, Damien, um, going back to answer the first question there first, um, the surplus lambs, they're reared on a Yo2 Yo feeder. Um, and then cross fostering, yeah, there would have been some cross fostering on singles. Um, I just don't really spend too much time trying to cross foster because the O's are laminate in, in three weeks like so from start to finish the first jaw lambs the last jaw the vast majority of them is over in three weeks so don't have the space for you to be taking up a pin for that long like you know so if it doesn't really work out fairly quick they're, they're put onto the feeder like you know it's, it's, it's a matter of timing as well as was having a single when you want one or that having a single yeah. lamin when you want it. like if there's a single lamin and there's a triplet lamin at the same time they'll be fostered across like you know but yeah i yeah. don't really be putting them into foster you know it's too much that, that's perfect and th- there's just um a question then for frank um in terms of your silage testing um where you have round bales uh, and a lot of different batches, I suppose. What's your What's your advice in terms of uh, silage testing, uh, where you'll have bales of different quality? So, look, I think it's important that where you have different batches. You, you first of all, do it correctly, get a core and core into the, the center of the bale, so you get a proper representative sample. You know, and look at it's a, it's a couple of bales per batch then. You know, to make sure that you you don't know, just pick the worst. You know, you could be unlucky and put your core into the best bale of a batch, and it might just be the right bale in the middle of the field or something. So, it's you know, it's a couple of bales per batch, and actually put a core into it to get a proper representative sample out of the middle. You know, I think most uh, most uh, Chagas advisors will have a core, or whoever you're dealing with in terms of your 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 concentrates will be able to get you a core and do it properly. You know, we've had we have a we had a case a couple of years ago of a, a better farmer who was convinced he had made absolutely fabulous quality silage. And when the results came back, it was 57 DMD, and I rang him to tell him it was 57 DMD. And I was, uh, I knew ring making the phone call, it wasn't going to be a good phone call. And by the time I had the first couple of minutes it over, I knew it was a bad phone call. I said to him, what, how did you take the sample anyway? I said, uh, he said, ah, I took his fist out of, out of the truck there the other morning. I just wanted to see what it was like. So 
uh, you know, that was only the, the residues that were left over. And when we coded it, it was a far better bale of silage than what, what we thought. So it's important that's done right so that you get an accurate assessment of what it is. Yeah. Just another one, Frank, there, and there's a number of questions around this, and it's just really to get your your your, your comment on it. Um, there's a couple of different, I suppose, feeding options. Uh, some people are mentioning lick buckets. Are they needed? Are they a good idea? Uh, there's also questions about, and again, we don't have the time to get into specifics, but maybe your comment on uh, feeding beet or feeding forage crops to yours pre 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 -lab. So I'll start with the, the leak buckets first. So I assume, Damien, we're talking about energy leak buckets. Yeah. Um, they're generally very expensive form of energy to feed compared to feeding your ration. Now, look, at they have a place maybe in a hill system where getting out with cobs or other sort of nuts isn't an option. You know, in very hard to reach areas, they will help there. They'll keep you all gathered. They will give them an energy supply, but it's very expensive. Generally speaking, if you have an option to feed a nut on a forage, that's the best option in terms of price and in terms of, you know, performance and quality, you know, the return you'll get out of it. Um, your second question then around the forage crops look at a lot of people using forage crops we could go through each one of them here for the next hour and the pros and cons and how much meal it should be getting and vice versa what I would say the one key pitfall I see with it every year with people doing it is if it's a case that they're on the forage crops and then they're going into the shed pre-lambing particularly where you're leaving them out maybe two or three weeks pre-lambing you need to be very careful that before those yos are housed that they've had a couple of weeks where they've been getting the forage that they're going into and the meal that they're going into outdoors so that you don't create a sudden shock in their diet, which can lead to, you know, which can lead to a lot of problems once they get housed in. So it's important that they're adapted over to their indoor diet before they go in. It's a, gr a gradual change over. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, I think Frank, you 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 answered this one in your in your in your presentation, but just maybe to to, uh, to maybe reemphasize the importance. Uh, somebody's asking here: Is it better to feed uh, for sheep in a shed? Is it better to feed once per day? If we take it, they're talking about concentrates. Um, this into two two feeds. Maybe just to, to, to run over that point again. Yeah, so look, with the concentrates, with the concentrates, once you go above five or 600 grams per head, then it has to be twice a day. You know, anything above that in one single feed will lead to problems in terms of acidosis, will lead to sick yours, down yours, and you ultimately you could lose yours as well. So once you go above that, it has to be twice a day and eight hours apart. In terms of your forage that you're putting in, if there's sufficient forage going in, you know, and you're able to pile enough in front of them that by the time if you pile it in once a day, when you come back the next morning, there's still some forage available and that they're not all scrumming at the barrier. Well, then once a day is enough with that, it might need to be pushed in at some stage during the day. But with the, you know, it's provided, that is provided that you don't come back that afternoon and find that they have it all let out. You know, they need to have forage at all times. Okay. Very good. We'll just uh, flick over to yourself again, Shane. Um, uh, they're, they're asking here, um, am I right in saying that they're asking how, how does Shane mix, uh, do mixing of his your ration? Um, am I right in saying your, your, your main, your ration or your laminus is, is, is brought in? And that it's just a guess of how uh, uh, that you're, you're feeding that straight to the, to the singles because of your high quality silage. Am I, am I right in saying that, Shane? You're not doing any mixing yourself, really. No, no, there's no mixing there. I mean, it's it's a it's a nut I'm feeding. So, um, and then the as you said, the singles are just getting the soya bean t just along on top of the silage. Perfect. Um, and a, a question for Shane. Then I suppose maybe it's uh, in terms of of your own preference. You you have you have straw bedded um, housing and you have flats all, all under the one roof. Um, in general, which which do you prefer? Or put these pros and cons to both, maybe. Yeah, so I suppose, Damien, you know, that's, that's that's a question that people say fairly or ask me fairly regular with the shed. Um, to be honest with you, I, I don't really see much of a difference between the slats and the straw bedding. I suppose for the triplet bearing yaws, maybe they're a small bit more comfortable on the straw because they're heavier and they're probably down, lying down a bit more. But, you know, from a point of view of lamin on them, I see no difference really. Um, I'd nearly rather the plastic slats for laminon just that's a per personal preference just okay. i don't know why you know it's you know you have you, the stuff the the water bag and everything disappears down into the tank as soon as it falls you know so yeah yeah and again but now the, sorry just Go like on. now saying that like you know before i start lamin the sh shed is power washed and disinfectant you know the the week in the run up like the slats are power washed clean like as if they were fresh like you know yeah. so they're not lamin on dirty slats and again, you're moving them fairly, fairly quickly onto onto into individual pins anyway from there anyway. So there's no yeah. As soon as the lambs hit the ground, they're going into individual pins, like you know. Yeah. So yeah. 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 Very good. Um, 
there's uh, well, I'm just conscious of time. There's a question there, Frank. I, 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 how long before lambing should should yours be housed? I mean, again, it's very dependent on on grass supply and everything like that. But I, I say the question is, you know, to, is, is it is it important to be aware of you know maybe not housing right on the point of lambing or that or yeah, you're... look at it, it. There's a there's a number of ways you go at that. Look at it in a in a March lambing system where you're lambing the grass. Ultimately, your farm should be closed up by now. You know that grass should be reserved for the spring. You know, that you're not going in grazing things that have been closed already in, in October and November. So, you know, and that generally dictates once you get to the end of the, the autumn grazing plan that Shane has talked about for us before, you know, once you run out of grass in that autumn grazing plan, rather than going back to the start again to go into the shed. I suppose in terms of if you're thinking of bringing them in off crops or for you're feeding them outdoors, look at the closer you get to lambing, the more risky it gets in terms of, you know, your yo is heavier in lamb and a change in our environment or change in our diet can lead to more problems. So like I would be saying you'd want to be getting her in three to four weeks before lambing at a minimum and then before you house her that she's adapted onto whatever diet she's going to be going onto when she goes into the shed. You know, and the the earlier the better really. Like the, the later you leave it, the ten we tend to see you get more problems in terms of prolapse or digestive upsets. So again, as you said earlier on, avoid any sudden changes, Frank. Yeah, sudden changes are what you're really, really mm-hmm. striving to, to go against. Yeah. And there's a, a question here. Is there any, uh, well, the, you know, what are the benefits of, of adding minerals um, in, in the, to your pre lambing nutrition? Uh, again, sure, I suppose, um, your comments on, on that in most, uh, most pre-mixed um, will, will include a, a pre lambing uh, mineral anyway. Exactly. Most pre-mixed rations will have a pre lamb and mineral in it. Uh, we could do a, a series of days on mineral nutrition, Damien, and we, might, we wouldn't, still wouldn't have it all covered, so I'm not going to go down that, that rabbit hole. But I suppose the important thing is that the O's are getting, you know, have a, have some access to minerals. And generally, if they have, if you buy a, a ration, it'll have pre lamb and minerals in it, that should be sufficient to cover them. Like we often maybe, the one thing I would say on minerals is sometimes when things, we aren't, when we see sheep not performing, we sometimes jump at the minerals thing. You know, and I would say to people, you know, look at your basics first, make sure your feed management is right, your forage management is right, your quality is good, your ration is good, and you work your way down along your list of problems before you maybe look for the, the silver bullet in, in minerals or anything like that. Yeah. And uh, maybe just come back to the, the housing one, uh, somebody's asking here uh, about having sheep. Uh, I know that's the case in, in, in Shane's shed where they're, they're, they're permanently in the shed. Um, is there any advantage to having it, them access to a... Uh, a paddock or that they have access to come in and out of the shed I suppose um, yeah you would hear people talk about this not that I have seen or not that I've known to be tested anyway the danger with that is yours coming in and out of pens and in and out your gates every day you increase that you know that likelihood that a yo is going to get a knock or going to get hit and could lead to a slipped lambs or a hurt yo so look at to, to my benefit to my mind I see no benefit to it once a yo has sufficient floor space she shouldn't need to be in now depends for for exercise or anything like that. Perfect. Um, maybe just if, Shane, I'm I'm conscious of time. We're approaching nine o'clock. There's just a couple of very quick ones for yourself to finish off. We'll give you the last word. Um, in terms of the straw bedding or the slats, uh, do you notice any difference between the level of na- lameness um, on on the straw bedding versus the slats, or is there any? Any comment or any any noticeable difference? No, I suppose. I mean, um, there doesn't really seem to be a whole point of difference now. The O's will be foot bathed regular, and once they go in, like you know, they'll be foot bathed going in, and they'll be foot bathed maybe three weeks after going in again. And you know, they're kind of done every three weeks up until they get their cluster or their their booster vaccines and stuff. And after that, then they're not foot bathed. So no, I wouldn't say any difference in the lameness and the slats than the straw bedding. Yeah. And there's just a quick, a quick one here. The, um, vaccination. Um, when do you, do you give them a clostridial uh, booster? Uh, when when do you do that uh, for the flock? Yeah, so that that they they get their clostridial booster what four weeks before four lambing starts. Perfect. You know. Yeah, yeah. And just going back going back finally to a, a, a slide that Frank had up earlier on. Um, you know, you, you had impressive uh, birth weights and impressive uh, seven-week weights. Do you, do you feed concentrates uh, to the O's after turnout, or no? They they they're turned out to grass only. There's no there's no concentrates. I don't have I don't have the time to go around feeding concentrates to the O's and grass. Yeah. So, and again, that probably goes back to that goes back to your your autumn closing plan and having them closed up and having enough of uh, having enough of grass ahead of them when you, when you turn them out. Um. 
So, well, Damien, it. I just might clarify one point just on the minerals. You know, like I said, you go just not in, just in case I sounded too flippant about minerals. It's important that there's a pre-lamin mineral in your ration, pre-lamin. But you know that if you have a problem, I said you go through all the other things first. But if you think it's a mineral problem, that you actually go and get it tested and investigated before you maybe start look, looking for, for answers that aren't there. It's important that you investigate it before you take any action. You know, because there is instances there where you might have an issue, but it's, you need to get that looked at first before you before you take action. Very good advice, Frank. Uh, thanks for that. Um, as I say, I'm conscious of time. We're we're just bang on nine o'clock. Um, thanks uh, to, to the two lads. Thank you very much, Frank, for, for your presentation. Uh, thanks in particular to Shane. Um, he's always very uh, facilitating to us in, in, uh, in helping us out with, with these type of events. Um, we hope to have a, a recording of this webinar available uh, on our Chagos website in the coming days. I want to thank yourselves. It was a great number uh, joined the webinar tonight. And thank you very much for your contributions and your questions. Um, we're back with you again on the 8th of February uh, at the same time. Uh, and on and that particular webinar, we'll be discussing uh, the flock health issues uh, pre-lambing. So until then, thank you very much, everybody, and good night.